Yeah, I guess we should start. Yeah. Hello, uh, welcome to the International Association for the Study of the Commons second annual World Commons Week events. Uh, this is the regional keynote webinar for Latin America where Ileana Monta Montesero, sorry, Ileana of the Center for International Forestry Research will be giving a talk entitled, How Tenure Reform Processes Can Lead to Improved Governance of Indigenous Commons, Experiences from Latin America. My name is Charlie Schweik. I'm a professor at the University of Massachusetts Amherst, and I'm a member of the International Association for the Study of the Commons Executive Council, and I'm the organizer of the World Commons Week event. As people on the call may understand, uh, World Commons Week is a global annual event that's celebrating and promoting both commons research and practice and has two primary components. One is a coordinated local events um, around the world, and this year a set of regional or continental keynote webinars. The latter is one of IASC's efforts to promote a global dialogue on commons research and practice by taking advantage of internet-based webinar technology, allowing our community to gather virtually while reducing our community's carbon footprint and its impact on the global atmospheric commons. So I uh, really appreciate the attendees um, and, the, and uh, the panelists that are here. Um, before I turn it over uh, to Peter to introduce our speaker, let me explain how the webinar will work. Um, so we've asked Ileana to talk for roughly 35 minutes I'm gonna act as the timer. I'm gonna provide a, re a reminder through the webinar chat function when Ileana has 10 minutes left and five minutes left. Uh, and then the last 15 minutes, we'll have uh, time for questions and answers. So for attendees, um, I don't know if you've used a Zoom webinar before. If you haven't, um, what, what, to ensure the webinar functions well, we're limiting video and, and audio, so the bandwidth um, is good for the speaker. Um, to ask a question, um, we ask you to do uh, use the Q&A function, which if you move your mouse around the Zoom window, there should be a menu uh, that has some options, and one is Q&A. If you click on that uh, on your computer, you can, it'll open a question and answer window, and that's where you can type in questions um, to the speaker. Um, if you can't find that function, there's also chat, which I'll be monitoring. And there's also a mechanism for you to raise your hand um, on, the, on the participants window that you can't see, but I can see, and I'll unmute you. Um, for attendees on the call, um, I'm looking, uh, I don't know if anybody's in the situation, but in case there is, if, there, if someone is called in by phone, you can let me know you've got a question by dialing star nine to toggle or raise and lower the hand function. And I'll see your hand raised and I'll unmute you so you can ask your question. So, um, so that's the game plan. I'd like to now turn it over to Peter Cronkleton, uh, IS, who, who acts as ISC Regional Coordinator for Latin America to introduce our speaker. So thanks, Ileana, and thank you, Peter, over to you. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Peter Cronkleton from the Center for International Forestry Research. I'm also serving this year as IASC's coordinator for Latin America. And it's my pleasure to introduce my colleague, Ileana Montoroso, who is an environmental scientist with the Equity, Gender, Justice, and Tenure team at the Center for International Forestry Research. She also coordinates the Gender and Social Inclusion Research Program within, uh, within C4. Ileana has a Bachelor of bachelor's of science degree in biology, a master's of science degree, and a PhD in environmental science from the Autonomous University in Barcelona. She has participated in global comparative studies that have analyzed forest tenure and reforms around the collective in multiple countries in Latin America. And her research focuses on gender, tenure, collective rights, environmental governance, and social environmental conflict, predominantly in Latin America. With that short Introduction, I would like to pass it over to Ileana for her presentation. Welcome, Ileana. Thank you, Peter, and thank you, Charlie, and thank you for ISC for the invitation to collaborate in this collective effort. And thank you all for being with us today. Um, during this presentation, and let me, yeah. So during this presentation, I will draw on extensive research on forest tenure reforms 
to analyze recent processes of bright evolution on large forest areas from the perspective of commons. Um, focused on Latin America, I will lay out a definition of indigenous commons and discuss how the process of reclaiming uh, commons can help us understand the challenges that emerge from existing policies that formalize collective rights to lands. So you'll see my presentation will uh, discuss briefly the um, research study that provides empirical basis for our analysis, pre presenting some concepts and methodological approaches. Then I will discuss the process of evolution of indigenous commons in Latin America and our understanding of the concept. And drawing on specific examples, more on Peru and Colombia, I will discuss existing challenges as well as, um, as, as existing challenges and also provide some policy recommendations. So, to start and tell you a bit about this uh, global comparative study on forest tenure reform, this is a five-year research project that uses mixed method approaches to collect information on recent tenure reform processes in seven different countries. The extent to which we um, collected the information varies and you will see Peru, Uganda and Indonesia is where we collected information at the uh, community, subnational and national level in comparison to the other countries. Um, the, well, just to share a bit of some of the key concepts that I will be using during this presentation. Forest tenure reforms are understood as changes in statutory regulations that define the bundle of rights and responsibility over who uses, manages, and controls forest resources and how. While some of these uh, re reform processes have also targeted individual property rights. In this presentation, in our analysis, I will be talking mainly on collective tenure regimes, which refer mainly to forest dependent communities, indigenous peoples, and Afro descendants. So, um, in this process, just to give you a bit of a broad background of the methodological framework that we follow, we're understanding forest tenure reforms as a quite dynamic process that require an understanding of the historical context at the local and national level, as well as a legal analysis of the multiple regulations that support existing form of tenure at the different levels. Where the process of implementation requires identifying the institutional framework, this is the, the type and governance level where government organizations that have competencies and functions in regards to the process of um, formalization of collective rights, as well as the type of steps that a community is required to, to comply with the process, including the time and the cost that is related with this compliance. And in terms of the outcomes of these reform processes, we're not only talking about the number of titles, or the extension of the forest land where these collective rights have been recognized, but also the gap um, between existing claims and the extent to which these processes can actually improve livelihoods, environmental conditions, and tenure security at the local level. Um, so why the focus on Latin America? So first you will see in this graph that globally, most of the forest lands um, are still held by communities, indigenous peoples, or customary peoples, um, and approximately 65% of the available land is under some form or customary tenure. But in practice, uh, less than 20% of that land has been formally recognized to these groups. So you'll see from the graph the differences across the developing regions, and also the evolution in which these, uh, which, in which processes of, of devolution of rights have taken place between 2002 and 2017, where you will see that still, you know, most of the forest lands are owned or administered by the state, especially in Africa, with some changes in Asia, but, you know, like a, a significant change in the portion of the land and the forest that is now being managed or designated for, for use or under the property of local communities or indigenous peoples in Latin America. So Latin America alone represents 60% of this uh, devolution process in the developing regions. So the type of 
of um, reforms and forest rights that are brought up by these models across region is very diverse. So you will have Africa and Asia using uh, types of reform that normally um, devolve fewer rights, uh, mainly use and access, sometimes management, in comparison to the types of reform that are being promoted in Latin America, where you know the extent of rights that are being recognized include um, the, the the collective right to, to own the land and forest for some of the, the indigenous groups. Um, so a lot of this process that we observe in Latin America needs to be understood in the context of how the indigenous claims over commons have evolved and in, particul in, in particular the role that the indigenous movements have had in terms of claiming access and control over resources. So in the case of Peru, we see the key role that IDESEP, the Indigenous National Federation, uh, has had in terms of not only making sure that the regulations are in place, but also promoting that the, that the regulations are being implemented. Or Yatama in the case of Nicaragua, or the Proceso de Comunidades Negras in Colombia, and Onik also in Colombia. So a lot of these movements, the, the claim uh, the indigenous claim over commons from these movements were centered in the recognition of identity, closely linked to the, to the recognition of autonomy and self-determination that, that pushed towards the recognition of land and um, the formalization of resource rights to claim uh, tied to this uh, concept of identity. So a lot of these historical tr struggles that determine the resource access and entitlement to indigenous peoples, peoples in the America region. Um, so in terms of the, 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 the concept of indigenous people's rights and indigenous governments in Latin America, there's two processes that we, we think are very important to understand how it evolved. First is the whole um, negoci international negotiations around conventions that formalize uh, collective indigenous rights. Um, more specifically, the United Nations Declaration um, of Indigenous Peoples in 2007 and the ILO 169 Convention in 1989. They not only recognize the collective right to land, um, but it also recognized the right to self-determination and autonomy and the recognition that Indigenous Peoples have suffered loss of control over their lands and resources. So this process of mobilization and the international con conventions actually allow for a process of formal recognition and governments um, modifying their own regulations to formalize collective rights to indigenous. So, so while some of, the, of the, some of these reforms go very back, like in, in the case of Mexico, to the Mexican Revolution in 1910, other processes have followed um, this process of social mobilization. Like in Peru 19, in 1974, in Brazil, Colombia, Nicaragua, which are more recent. But, the implementation, like it, at least uh, in, in formally, um, these processes of changes in regulation have actually allowed for a significant portion of national territory to become um, in the hands of, this, uh, of indigenous groups. So in Mexico, you have 50% of the land in hands of indigenous communities under the figure of ejidos, or agrarian communities. In Peru, this includes native communities, but also peasant communities in the highlands and the coast. In Brazil, this is includes a broad range of reforms, including the recognition of quilombolos, um, destructive reserves, and uh, the recognition of indigenous lands as well. So in some of these countries, these changes in regulations have actually allowed a significant portion of land to be in the hands of indigenous peoples, at least um, in paper. So what are indigenous commons? In this presentation, I will mainly, when I talk about indigenous commons, um, I'm referring mainly to two uh, characteristics. First, the resources. This is the, not only referred to the flow and benefits that derived from resources, um, claim or held in possession by indigenous peoples. So it's both the tangible and the intangible goods and services provided by the resources where indigenous uh, peoples exist. So this would be timber and non-timber forest products, but this could also refer to the knowledge and traditions 
that indigenous peoples tie to their forest lands. But it also refers to the set of institutions, including customary or traditional institutional arrangements that promote collective action and define the way indigenous peoples access, use, and manage the resources. And another characteristic that, um, that we also recognize when we're talking about indigenous commons in the case of Latin America is the specific link with territorial demands. So the recognition or the formalization of resources for indigenous peoples is quite tied to the recognition of the territory and the fact that the identity um, and the culture of indigenous peoples is tied to the recognition of the relationship that they have with the territory. So historically, commons have played a key role in sustaining indigenous knowledge, culture, and traditional practices. Across the region, the state may or may not recognize these systems. So whenever I talk about the institutional arrangements, the defining, well, it's not only about you know, the formalization process, but also those institutions that actually legitimize the different claims over indigenous commons at different levels. So sometimes these claims might be formalized through the state by the promotion and of legal regulations. So there is a law, a guideline, a provision that um, specifically recognizes the collective right um, to land or to forests, to indigenous groups. But in some other cases, this uh, set of institutions also exists at the community level, you know, and it refers to the arrangements that determine who will get to use which resources and how. And this can be either written formally or not. So while we, during the previous slide, you could see that in the Latin American region, we have witnessed an important um, norm, like extension, not only in terms of extension, but also in terms of the changes in regulations that have actually recognized collective rights to indigenous groups and a different processes of formalization that are being implemented on the ground, we still observe that there are uh, challenges to secure and support effective governance of indigenous commons. And for the sake of time in this presentation, I will mainly refer to four. So the first challenge refers to the reconciliation of the scope of rights granted with existing claims over resources. And this goes back to how the governments actually are understanding the claims of our commons versus how these are being formalized on the ground. So, and the scope of rights that the regulations are actually recognizing. Um, so what's happening on the ground is that we observe that even though, you know, like there is like regulations in different countries are recognizing rights over land, some of the key natural resources are excluded. So let me give you some examples from Colombia and Peru. Um, and sometimes those regulations are tied to restrictions or the ability to use or derive benefits from the rights acquired. So in the case of collective tenure in Colombia, and I'm gonna be referring very quickly to the reform process in Colombia. Well, the recognition, the formal recognition of collective tenure in Colombia dates back to 1991 which is also the year that Colombia um, um, endorsed the ILO Convention WAC 69. In the case of Colombia, there are two specific forms of collective tenure that are recognized by law, the indigenous resguardos and the Afrodescendant communities or the community councils. However, with the implementation of the peace accords, there are new forms um, that are being discussed for the recognition of collective rights, uh, of collective tenure, and I'm referring mainly to the peace and reserve zones that are being discussed as another potential figure of collective tenure under the peace agreement, but still under discussion. However, as we were talking uh, previously, um, these regulations are coexist with other regulations that define the access to forests and um, the establishment of protected areas. So, you know, like in this map, you will see the um, distribution of um, indigenous resguardos and um, uh, Afro-descendant communities. In the case of indigenous communities, mainly in the Amazon, but also in, uh, in the highlands, in the case of Afro-descendant communities, ma mainly in the Pacific or in the Choco region, but also in the Caribbean. But one of the things that we're seeing is that despite 
there's already almost 33% of Colombia that has already been formalized as collective tenure. There are still, and you, there are still some claims in terms of pending, um, in particular for Afro-descendant communities, especially in the Caribbean region. So moving to the second example, in the case of Peru, the regulation of Peru is one of the earliest uh, in South America. The first regulation of native communities in the Amazon leads back to 1974, with some changes in regulation that came afterwards. And then in the case of indigenous communities in the highlands and the coast that took in the late 1980s. Um, and you know, like there have been, even though there is, uh, there haven't been that major reforms in terms of these two regulations that recognize the collective rights to land, there have been a lot of reforms in terms of regulations that, um, that regulate forests and lands. So that creates a lot of problems in terms of implementation and in terms of how this indigenous group can actually um, benefit from the rights acquired. So in terms of the claims of the, of the implementation process, even though in the case of Peru, there is a significant progress in terms of the number of communities, but also the extension, um, the area where these communities have been recognized, there is still um, a number of claims in terms, like not only from native communities, but also peasants in terms of, um, you know, like being able to respond to the uh, communities that have not yet been titled. So the second challenge, as I mentioned, it's, you know, the one that emerges from uh, addressing like existing legal overlaps. So you have, um, you know, most of the time, all of the regulations that are formalizing lands to rights and to forests, but there are different set of regulations that, uh, that define who, who gets access, for instance, to non-renewable resources like areas where there is petroleum or mining interest or water as well. And in these cases, um, the extent to which uh, sometimes as well, there are cases in which communities might have the right to land, but in order to benefit from access to forests and for management of forests, they need to follow different regulations as well, which adds to the process of implementation. Um, well, and of course, there's the cases where you have simultaneously areas that are being classified as conservation areas. And the fact that even though the, you know, countries have progress in terms of the extent of the area that is being recognized to communities, some of these same areas um, are also being granted for concession on their rights for the extraction of mining or other non-renewable resources. Um, so this leads to the compartmentalization of rights, uh, which actually undercuts the territorial integrity and the territorial demand. As I said earlier, it's one of the characteristics of the, of the indigenous commons. Um, so to give you very briefly a couple of examples, in the case of Colombia, this is a, uh, um, the map and the graphs are showing the extent to which the um, already recognized, formalized um, ethnic forms of collective tenure in Colombia actually overlap with the strategic ecosystems. Um, and the fact that some of these areas that have been recognized as indigenous resguardos or Afro-descendant communities have also been um, either declared as a category of protected area or are found within a forest reserve zone, which actually would limit the extent of um, activities and benefits that the communities that live there uh, can obtain. So in the case of uh, Peru, we actually map five different types of overlaps um, where communities can either you know, like a like community that's interested in being titled or that actually has already been titled, sometimes overlaps areas that have been mapped or um, targeted for timber production or have already been uh, categorized under a protected area or are being also claimed by, um, by, by an, an individual uh, to claim individual property rights. 
So the, the problem here is that each type of overlap requires a different legal procedure for communities to actually either be able to get their collective title or be able to acquire rights from the, from the once the community has been, um, has been formalized. The third challenge that we see, and is, this is uh, also linked to the of existing overlaps, is the, is the extent to which these communities can actually gain tangible benefits from the formalization process. So uh, even though, you know, like in some cases, countries have progress and they have enacted regulations that formalize the collective rights, sometimes the reform are lacking specific provisions that allow to operationalize rights. For instance, in the case of Peru, um, communities are required to follow a different procedure for those lands that are being classified as forest, as forests in Peru are, can, are public property and cannot be, can only be granted to indigenous groups or to anybody um, on their usufruct rights. So this requires, you know, like, an, and most of the communities that have already gained their title to the land that has been classified as agrarian um, lands, um, they're still waiting for the process to uh, formalize the rights in lands classified as forest. And in other cases, the regulatory frameworks do not create the enabling conditions. Either rights are conditional or non-permanent, or the system of co-management, in particular in cases where you have these legal overlaps that involve different government institutions in the process that um, make quite difficult the coordination and implementation, not only for government institutions, but in terms of communities to know whom they should be going to, to be able to, 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 um, to gain benefits from the management of forests, and this creates uh, additional costs and burdens. So I will use the case of Peru, and what you see here is in Spanish, is just the number of steps that a community in the Amazon needs to follow to get uh, the formalization of um, their collective rights through a title. And communities are required to follow 22 different steps, which involve different institutions. So we map the steps, but we also map the number of government agencies involved. And we saw that in the case of Peru, the formalization processes in, in law requires at least 20 steps involving at least seven different organizations. But in practice, during the implementation, we um, identify that in some communities were forced to follow more than 30 different steps involving more than 10 different communities to be able to gain the, um, to gain the title and to benefit from the title acquired. And since the, you know, with the, the number of, of government institutions, it's so, uh, it, well, it's, it's so, so large. We also ask them the extent to which these uh, government organizations are coordinating among themselves. And basically, um, only half of these organizations have, are coordinating. So this means that uh, for communities, it's, it becomes quite difficult, um, not only in terms of the implementation process, but also in terms of following procedures to be able to gain rights once the title has been given. We also ask communities, and this is information at the community at the local level, whether, you know, like um, the extent to which this formalization process has meant a change in terms of livelihoods. And we ask them their perception uh, to whether, you know, the, the titling of their community um, had actually trans, you know, like it meant a change in the, in the livelihoods. And we see changes across not only at the regional level, but in terms of who's benefiting from these reform processes. So we see that even though um, there is an important, uh, that more than 50% of the community people will say that, they, they, that the income and the livelihood has improved since the community has been titled, there are some changes uh, in particular in terms of the extent to which women and men would respond um, similarly. And we observe that women would be less likely to respond 
um, that their income and livelihood has improved. So this means that also so in terms of the implementation process at the local level, there are some um, forms of differentiation uh, and you know, in terms of the implications and the types of outcomes that the tightening process and the formalization process can um, generate on the ground. We also ask them, um, you know, like how the tightening process uh, made any difference in terms of the, the extent to whether the perception on tenure security. And we also see these changes in terms of um, how women and men perceive tenure security, even though um, more than 75% of both men and women would say that they, they perceive their rights and the access to land and forests have, be, have, been, uh, have become uh, more secure since the titling process. When we ask about uh, whether they are concerned that someone might dispute those rights, <coughs> sorry, and whether that uh, titling process made any change in terms of income and livelihood, as I said, um, there is difference across in terms to not only uh, fewer men and women would <coughs> feel threatened at some point, but also so there would be difference between what men and women would perceive those rights as secure. Um, okay, so the fourth challenge is tied to the notion of, of territory. And the fact that the formalization process is one thing, but the operationalization of the formalization process into the governance of this as a territory, it's more complex. So formalization redefines the collective, but not the representation. So issues of legitimacy, of authority, um, required other type of processes. The formalization and the, and the titling or the, um, the, the titling process does not necessarily resolve internal conflicts nor eliminate external pressures. And this, is, this becomes quite evident, um, for instance, in regions like Madre de Dios, in the case of Peru, where there is more pressure on some communities because of mining interests or petroleum interests. Um, but also the fact that the, the um, operationalization of territory, the construction of territory requires a, a, a clear consensus on boundaries, but also a shared understanding of rights and agreement uh, on authority. And, you know, institutions uh, that emerge from constant negotiation and adaptation. So this is an ongoing process where the, the process of formalization is just the beginning. So to, to oh, try, well, just to close in this up, we also observe that the perception of tenure security from, the, from different level at the local level, but also at the, at the subnational level, is not necessarily also only tied to the title. You know, like the formalization processes in different countries have been promoted um, with the idea that titling will lead directly to uh, tenure security. And just to share uh, very quickly um, an exercise that we did at the local level um, in terms of, you know, how local communities and how subnational stakeholders perceive tenure security. One of the things that we observe from results is that, um, you know, the, the, the community, the relationship between the, how, how the community perceives their rights are secure is also quite tied to the conditions of the forest and um, the, you know, the relationship between the community and, and the government and, and the role that the government institutions have in terms of what happens after the titling has been um, enacted. So what are the policy implications that we, that, that we can get from these discussions? So we see that while reforms that recognize collective tenure rights are advancing across developing regions, there we, and there have been indeed uh, major reforms and changes in regulatory frameworks. Um, there are variations in terms of the scope of rights that are being granted during the formalizations. And sometimes these formalizations are lacking the clarity or the specific prov provisions to actually exercise them in practice. We see that the implementation, it's very, diverse 
um, but also in terms of how the um, tenure security perception actually varies across men and women. We um, this evidence this shows that there is it's quite important also to address gender issues and how the different groups, not only women and men, but also different uh, groups um, from different ethnic groups or from different age groups could have different perceptions and ways to benefit from the devolution processes to ensure that these formalizations are not actually promoting further social differentiation. On the other hand, we also see that in some cases, the way these reforms are being framed um, result in the compartmentalization of rights, which is contradictory to the notion of territorial rights inherent to the claim of indigenous peoples, and in particular, the claim on commons, on indigenous commons. Um, the fact that states are differentiating the set of rights, for instance, the extraction of subsoil rights from land um, limits the extent to which uh, indigenous groups at the local level can actually um, benefit in practice. It also calls for the, to promote um, territorial level policies that consolidate, that support territorial development dynamics. So this is also rethinking the role of the state in terms of this formal, formalization process. If we, if the, um, if we were aiming at improving governance at the local level. So this is rethinking that the role of the state is not ending once the title or the permit or the authorization is being handled to the community, but also trying to um, review the set of regulations that are set in place, not only in terms of the overlaps, but in terms of the cost and the time um, and the multiple steps that are being tied with the implementation. Um, we also observe that the ongoing recognition of indigenous commons in the case of Latin America is also uh, highlighting some of the governance challenges that are emerging from the formalization of these rights. While the first three challenges are related to the extent to which formalization allows local communities to take advantage of acquired rights, it also highlights the risks of promoting formalization um, as a generalized normative prescription that assumes that tenure security will immediately follow from the handling of a title. So this idea that formalization, um, you know, will um, allow the immediate um, functioning of governance of commons is something that needs to be reviewed. On the other hand, the fourth challenge is related to the need to operationalize indigenous claims as territories, which also demands um, more support on the ground to, uh, for the governance structures of these indigenous commons uh, and the organizations that are involved. Um, the process also highlights the, the drivers of conflict endangering the livelihoods and the culture of indigenous peoples, especially from the increased um, threats that are coming from investments, from development and extractive in investment, especially overlapping these, these regions. Uh, so in conclusion, uh, indigenous commons refer to the resources, either claim or recognize, as well as the set of institutional arguments that define resource access, use, and control. In this presentation, I mainly refer to land and forest, but this, of course, um, refers to the broader concept of, of the territorial claims that underlie the indigenous commons uh, in the case of Latin America. Tenure systems are quite varied and shaped by different political conditions at the national level, but also by the characteristics of indigenous peoples, identities, beliefs, and livelihoods. So we also need to acknowledge the the specific context, but also the diversity of what indigenous commons we have in Latin America. Um, in terms of the complex set of tenure systems and the, the forms that exist on the ground. The process of right devolution in Latin America has resulted in this formalization of the indigenous rights as the way to improve governance and derive outcomes, not only in terms of tenure security, but also in in terms of livelihood and environmental conditions, what we overland and forest. Um, this is in the case of Latin America, this is and this is quite unique in comparison to what happens in Asia and Africa. Um, this is a result of historical struggles driven by indigenous and also broader social movements, which in the case of 
um, the region have not only allowed for these reforms, these regulations, these changes in statutory regulations to take place, but also to ensure the implementation. Um, but, you know, like from uh, what I shared with you today, we see that even though there has been important progress in terms of these changes, um, the implementation is quite varied across, and the nature of implementation and the gaps in progress um, differ uh, across the, the countries, uh, you know, and, and, um, and the extent uh, to which some indigenous groups in some countries are still waiting legal recognition, even in those countries where we see that, the, that the, the, the process and the regulation has actually been enacted, as you will see from the four challenges that um, I presented here, you know, even, you know, like for those that were able to get their title now, the challenge is to make sure that the livelihood is improved, that they actually get tangible benefits and they actually um, build and strengthen their own governance structures. So thank you for, um, so thank you for, for participating in the webinar and I look forward to the discussion. So back to you, Peter. Thank you. So, yeah, go ahead, Peter, or I can. If you want to manage the questions, uh, Charlie, that's fine with me as well. Okay. Um, uh, Ileana, we, we don't have a, a sound effect or a way to get sound for clapping, but I'm sure uh, the attendees, that was a really interesting talk. So, and, uh, so interpret the clapping even though we can't hear it. Thank you for, for preparing that and giving it. Um, we already have one um, question in the question and answer. The reminder of the attendees as we move now to the question and answer, uh, you have a Q&A box um, somewhere on your Zoom screen that you can use to ask questions. If you can't find that, there's the chat box. And I see that we have a, at least one call-in user if that person wants to um, ask a question, use the star nine to raise your hand and I'll uh, unmute you. Um, but, uh, and Ileana, I don't know if you can see the question and answer, although this might be made, well, it's to both of us, I think. Mm -hmm. um, the question of, I uh, wonder if your presentation will be made to the public. Um, I think we've agreed that this recording will go on the World Commons Week um, website. And also, I hope to talk to the ISC um, web person for the ISC Commons website um, to have it put there as well. Um, and uh, Ileana, I don't think I'm saying anything you disagree with, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. I think- so the, one, the, the one the uh, one point, maybe I'll ask you if you would be willing to do, we've done this for a couple of the other webinars, is you have some interesting citations to papers on your slides. Mm -hmm. If there's a way you could send me the references, I'll put those up along with the movie. Mm -hmm. um, Actually, just to comment quite quickly on that, um, right now on the slide, and then you can um, go to the presentation and then copy from there, you will see there is a link to the project publications. Okay. And I didn't mention this during the presentation, although I did include it, as you said, the references to the work. There is this presentation is building on a very collective effort from different colleagues that have been involved in this project, including Peter uh, with us here today. And most of the publications are available in English, but also in Spanish. So whomever is interested in some of, like taking a closer look on some of these issues, please go and check the, the website from the project, then you will see. Yeah, the um, website on the page that's being viewed right now. Yeah. Correct? Yeah. yeah. Great. So uh, I'm watching, we're watching the question and answer. If others on the call want to ask a question, in the meantime, um, uh, maybe I'll ask a question that I was curious about in terms of what you just alluded to. Um, this is a really amazing study, you know, that going back to that map you showed in the beginning of all the different research going on around the world. I, I was wondering if you could talk about um, the underlying, and this, this might be especially for anybody on the call who's a, a more junior scientist um, studying these issues. Uh, talk a little bit about the research methods that um, you're using to study these different cases. Um, mm -hmm. Is there a standard protocol or 
Is it more organic based on the case? How do you, how, how do you proceed with these studies? No, in this case, um, at least for the countries where we did, all, like we use seven different methods. Um, and some of these methods, and that's kind of the main variation between the countries. There's three countries where we were, we used the same uh, protocol for collecting the information and the tools, you know, the data collection tools uh, varied from the work at the community level where we use, we combine um, focus groups, households, intra-household surveys. So we collected information both from the men and the women, um, key informant interviews. Then at the, at the subnational level, we use scenario exercises, participatory scenario exercises, involving not only people from the communities, but also from indigenous organizations and other NGOs and government institutions working at the subnational level. And then at the national level, we did a historical, historical legal analysis, and also we used a survey to collect information for those government people involved in implementation. So it, it's, it's a lot of combination. Some of these um, um, tools can be, like the way these tools were used can be referred in the publications, but of course, if anybody is interested in, the, in, in any specific tool, then you can contact, contact me. And um, also to respond to Maria Paula's question uh, in terms of, you know, the work and the analysis that we did on gender. Um, we, in um, our just, work- Maybe we should, exactly. sorry, maybe we should repeat the question because, uh, well, I think the audience can see it, but I'm just in case somebody can't, like on the phone. Yes, so thank you, Charlie. The question from Maria Paula is that um, she's doing research on the intersections on youth and gender in indigenous territories in, in Bolivia. So she's asking about the perceptions of young men and women in terms of indigenous territorial governance. Actually, in the case, in our case, we did um, we did use some tools to collect. You know, like we, we work key informant interviews and focus groups. were targeting both, you know, youth specifically and um, different age groups to collect information from the different perspectives um, from these groups. In terms of results and variations. We did observe, like most of the differences that were observed were coming from the information that we collected between men and women. Although in terms of youth, and um, I would say that age would be an important factor in terms of the perception around rules, uh, about, you know, like whether the rules uh, related to the access and use of forest and land resources would be clear or known by the different groups. You can say there are some differences that some groups will be more likely to know and perceive the rules as clear and fair in comparison to others. And also another thing that we used to collect differences um, across groups was we used MAP, use MAP, um, because you know the, the formalization process, at least in Peru, requires the, the analysis of a demarcation. So for the demarcation, normally you would have people from the communities identify the, the areas and the type of uses that they have on resources. But of course, if you are inviting one set of the community, but you're living outside other groups, which might be Jews, which might be different ethnic groups that might be in a, in, in a community, then you would end up um, not having all of the areas included in the, in the demarcation process. So from the results that we saw, especially from women and men, we, would, um, we, we were able to show that there were some areas and some uses uh, that were not being mapped um, whenever you, like depending on who you were including. So if this is just being, the way this is being accounted in the demarcation process might mean in practice that you're leaving some rights or you're excluding some traditional use rights in the process of formalization. So we think that this is very, I mean, these intersections 
are really important in terms of how these processes are taking place on the ground. So great question. Thank you, Maria Paula. So Maria Paula, before we move to another question, I tried to unmute you in case you wanted to ask anything follow up, but that's not working. Do you want to, um, do you have any other response that you want to uh, before we move to another question? Um, no, I think uh, there was another yeah, question. Yeah, I just wanted to make sure Maria Paula didn't want to yeah. follow up. Okay. Um, okay, so, uh, so there's a question in chat. Um, Ileana, across Latin America, uh, there is variation between countries, the title, individual communities, and other, and others that uh, title, and other the title multi-community territories, mm. or even multi-ethnic territories. Mm -hmm. Could you discuss the strengths or weaknesses in terms of these approaches, particularly mm -hmm. in reference to your work with secondary organizations? Well, um, let me draw on one of the cases in Colombia where the the process of formalization especially in in is trying to especially in those areas that were affected by the by the internal conflict is actually trying to bring together people that have been pushed away from their traditional territories but they are trying to gain um the recognition of the of their collective rights um mixing uh, groups like indigenous groups with Afro descendants, and in some cases even um, peasant groups with, within one single territory. I would say that uh, the process takes longer because, of course, it means agreeing and reaching a consensus in terms of what this means in practice internally. I think it's quite tied to the fourth challenge that we mentioned of building territory and um, strengthening the territorial um, structures on the ground. And I would say, yeah, definitely the role of uh, secondary organizations, or I, I would say the indigenous organizations, that uh, and, and how they can facilitate this process. It's quite key and it, it, it's become quite important, like also in cases of Peru, where you have different ethnic groups um, being titled in the same community. Of course, it's not it, this requires that the government institutions that are involved in these implementation processes would um, be aware of how to to how to implement, you know, like a, this formalization uh, with an intercultural or gender sensitive approach, which is unfortunately not the case of what we observe. Even though, you know, like these issues of intersectionality of um, conflict of interculturality are very important in addressing the process of implementation. Most of the time, the government agents that are involved in this process are not aware on how to do this. So this uh, it's also pointing out to the need of building capacity of these government institutions that are involved and making sure that these um, government agents are, um, you know, like are can have the tools to be able to address conflicts on the ground in this type of cases. Very interesting. Um, so I just want to remind attendees if uh, we're watching in case others have questions. Um, while we're waiting, we're almost out of time, but while, uh, while we're waiting, if anybody else has a question, I have one that I, um, you know, one of the things about the IASC community that I love is that it's the intersection, um, it's dialogue, cross dialogue between science, um, scholarship and, and practice in the study of commons. And I was struck by this talk and that, um, you know, the rich scientific work you're doing to understand um, this, uh, uh, you know, uh, re-commoning in a way, um, Pro approaches um, and then the way you were closing with policy recommendations. Um, I'm wondering, Ileana, if you can reflect a little bit more about how that that science policy dialogue works with your organization in, in these different countries. Mm -hmm. Well, I think in the case of C4, um, it varies across because, you know, like it depends on the particular context. In some countries, 
and the type of engagement that you have with the different stakeholders has to be different depending on this context. Um, in the case of Peru, uh, as referred specifically to this study, it's it's been interesting, and I think that the the study actually was implemented in an interesting moment because it was around the time like the government of Peru had for years ignored this process and the implementation and the tightening of communities um, was almost halted. Uh, so there was nothing happening. And there was a lot of social mobilization around, which kind of uh, coincide with the, with the implementation of this research process, which actually made it a bit, a bit easier in terms of being able to, to have, you know, this interest from stakeholders to get engaged, but also it created a demand in terms of ensuring that we are providing sound, as you said, sound scientific research um, that is also responding to the, polit the political momentum, right? So it, it also makes us think as researchers in terms of the, of the what we're communicating, how we're communicating, the type of format that we're using. Um, in this case, I would say, you know, like uh, the, but it also brings a lot of very interesting opportunities in terms of how we can engage with the stakeholders and very exciting in terms of the um, implications that the research work can have uh, not only in terms of government policy but also in terms of supporting and informing the social mobilization process that takes place. Well thank you for that rich talk and the rich uh, Q&A of the answers. Um, I, I think we're just about out of time. I'm just looking to make sure there aren't any other questions that we've missed? Um, okay, we've got a hand up. Well, uh, maybe not. Um, hold on. Uh, there was a hand up quick and then it went down. Okay, um, I think we're good. So at this point, I think we're, uh, yeah, about out of time. Um, uh, so this is Charlie Schweik at the University of Massachusetts talking again. And let me now close this IASC uh, um, Latin American regional keynote address with a few final points. Um, uh, one, I want to thank um, both Peter for organizing this talk by Ileana. And Ileana, um, I, I know I speak for the community uh, on the call. Thank you so much for giving this talk. I guess one way we could apply it is if people can find the raise hands, give Ileana a high five with your hand, and we'll see that. But uh, you may not be able to find that function. That's OK. But Ileana, thank you so much for uh, the, yeah, there we've got at least there's some high fives coming up. Um, so this concludes actually our, our, our six regional or continental World Commons Week keynote webinars for the week. We've had one in Europe, Africa, China, North America, Asia, and uh, closing out the week with Latin America. Um, Ileana, would you mind uh, going to the next slide? Yes, yes, sorry. No worries, no worries. So I just wanted to make you aware that uh, this is the second year of this event. Last year we had, I think, 31 in our inaugural year. We had 31 local events or participants around the globe. This year we, we have roughly 55 that have happened this year um, where people are doing a local, some kind of local events around commons research and practice. So we're growing. And I don't think it's too early to... Uh, think about uh, World Commons Week 2020. Hopefully we can keep this uh, momentum going. Um, I also, maybe the next slide now, Alina? Yes. Um, I'd like to remind people, I know this for people in um, maybe a far to travel, but uh, uh, in Arizona State University in March, there's going to be a the third workshop, a working together workshop that uh, Marco Johansson is um, running. Um, so I wanted to make you aware of that, although I know that may be pretty far to travel. Um, next slide. And maybe before I, I talk to this slide, Peter, uh, it, again, thank you for your leadership with the uh, Latin American IASC group. Um, do you have any last words from your end? Uh, well, first, I just wanted to thank Ileana again. And we're in the process of organizing a regional meeting, possibly in Mexico in November of 2020. Uh, we 
we are waiting for some news back from Leticia, but uh, I hope within the next few weeks we'll be sending out some initial announcements to get people uh, uh, up to speed on what we are planning and probably asking for some volunteers. But right now there's still a few details to finalize, but uh, be watching for some announcements soon. Well, thank you, Peter. And um, again, thank you for your leadership here. And the last slide is just saying, um, reminding people that uh, we're an international community. If you're not a member, uh, consider joining IASC as a member. Um, uh, and uh, I really, again, appreciate um, the attendees for making this call, taking their time today. And uh, again, uh, to both Peter and Ileana for their efforts on this. Um, this will be recorded and will be on the World Commons Week website and probably the IASC-commons.org website. So with that, I'm gonna close the meeting and thanks again, everyone, and have a good rest of your day, whatever time zone you're in. Cheers. Yep. Goodbye, Charlie. Goodbye, Thank Elena. you. Thank you.